Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for your introduction uh, or your talk, which is in many ways, we have two education systems that are very much alike. Um, we also have a K through nine uh, and then high school after that. Um, and even different, not tracks, but different ways you can go after. So, I'll also give a very short introduction to the Danish context, which is much like the Finnish. We have a welfare society that I really have come to appreciate even more being mm -hmm. here. Um, we have a tradition of participation and decentralized decision making. We have challenges from new public management as uh, everywhere in the Western societies, uh, which is centralized, it is in its uh, intention to decentralize things. Um, we have uh, one of the world's most, world's most advanced countries when it comes to use of, of uh, computers, uh, both in society and in schools. And um, in many ways, I think Denmark has been one of the countries that have been most uh, keen to or have seen IT as both as a pressure and as, as an opportunity for society and for schools for good and bad because of course when you are in the front you make a lot of not necessarily good decisions about using computers and uh, so my talk will be about both the good and the bad parts of this um, a little more about the, the context we have this uh, purpose description for our Danish uh, Folke School, People's School uh, which I think I would like to uh, out a few points about um, so so the school is intended to promote a many-sided personal development of the individual pupil and um, there's a intention to make the students or the pupils, um, develop awareness imagination and acquire confidence in their own possibilities and background for committing themselves and taking action so we have a very our intention with our school is to make students part of our society in many ways academics is I see a difference in where in America you have this very clear focus on academics, so students should work hard to become uh, clever. While in I think in all the Nordic countries we have this um, balance between developing full-blown human beings and at the same time develop uh, academics, uh, which I come to appreciate more being here as well. Uh, so, so the goal is to prepare the pupils for participation, joint responsibility, rights and duties in society based on freedom and democracy. Uh, and therefore the daily life of school must be built on intellectual freedom, equality and democracy. So that's also part of the school. It's not necessarily the, the reality, but it's, it's the intention, the purpose. So, and we have uh, common goals, uh, much like uh, uh, Common Core here in the States. Um, they're competence-based, they're focused on situations, meaning that students should be able to handle uh, all the challenges in different situations. This means that our academic goals always have a, a or anyway, they have, they are intended to have a reason. So it's not, it's not you need to learn math because math is important, but you need to learn math because you can use math in different kinds of situations. We also have cross-disciplinary cross focus area. Uh, ICM Media has been there for several uh, decades even. We have a focus on innovation and entrepreneurship and on language learning, mostly language learning across uh, the disciplines. So, so not, not necessarily foreign, foreign language, but how language is used, used in different disciplines. So in my opinion, we have a, actually a rather innovative curriculum. Some people in Denmark would argue that I'm completely wrong. <laughs> so sad. Uh, we had a, a huge reform of the Danish schools in 2014, and that made a lot of uh, discussions. So um, we have this word word in uh, in Europe that we call didactics. It doesn't work well in English, but we need to introduce it to you to make you use it in a more uh, nuanced way, because it is, it, it, there's no way to translate it to English. So it's connected to teaching approaches, teaching methods, but it's also connected to pedagogies and so on. So uh, teachers have a freedom of method, 
which, which means that they can choose how to teach the students as long as they uh, promote their competences. We have a, a tradition of developing a, a wide variety of methods from project and project-based learning to storyline teaching learning cycle from that's from New Zealand and Australia, theme-based learning and all other kinds of, of uh, student involving methods but we also have a very traditional teaching methods as well as I will show you later. Uh, we have schools that experiment with all kinds of different organizations of, of uh, the school day even cross subject collaboration uh, and project work as part of the everyday school life. Um, okay so this talk is about computers and education. I'll give a very short history of uh, how it came about. Already in the 80s, uh, learning computers was part of the curriculum electives in computer science. I actually was part of a student at that time, so I was learning to pro or even or actually I learned how it uh, taught our teacher how to program. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And we worked with text process processing. There was very few education software packages, of course, at that time. In um, in the nineties, we began being aware that computers need to be integrated into the subjects. Uh, there was some investments in in hardware and software. Uh, they talked about toolboxes for teaching, so they were aware that it's not enough to put computers into uh, the classes. You need actually to develop uh, pedagogies and didactics. Um, there was a focus on getting network access to all schools, so we had this internet um, called the Sectionet that gave access to the internet at all schools already in the 90s, uh, but of course it wasn't available to all students at that time. There was a focus on teaching students and special teachers how to use computers, so it was a pretty technological focus. In the 2000s there was a lot of investments and a lot of or a number of large uh, national projects. So the national projects was in, intended to promote the use of IT and there was a lot of in local investments in technology. Just to give you an overview of three large national projects, we have this IT and media in the Folkeskolen K-9 in, in uh, 2001 4 with us. Uh, it was actually a pretty good program where, where there was funding for local projects to develop uh, IT didactics um, locally at schools and there was uh, research connected to it so it gave a lot of uh, knowledge about how to do it and how not to do it of course. Um, 323 million is around 50 million dollars mm -hmm. in a country of 5 million people so it's it's a lot of money. In uh, 2004 to 8 we have an investment for computers for third graders. There was a development of six large platforms for teaching to completely cover the subjects. It, it didn't turn, turn out well, but we learned a lot, I will say, uh, because of that. Uh, and in uh, 2011, we started, or the government started, uh, a project called Increased Use of IT in Folkeskolen, 1 billion. Half of it for improved infrastructure, so now every student has uh, wireless access to, to the internet, and one in three students, there's computers for one in three students now. And there was a huge uh, focus on investments in digital learning material, which I will say have been very good. So that's what other countries could learn from, actually, because we have uh, there's been a developed lots of good digital learning material now, uh, as opposed to before. We had uh, six, big, five big demonstration school projects. Uh, I was a research uh, manager on four of those. Um, I'll come back to them. There was a network for teachers, so the focus began moving. Uh, oh, just a second, I'll tell you what the focus moves from. So there was a lot of investments <coughs> at the same time, so there was investments in computers in the 90s, in, from 2005 onwards. Interactive white whiteboards got completely popular, and I'll say that was one of our big, big mistakes, because nowadays they are used to put, like, to but not for their original use, but uh, mostly like I'm using this whiteboard now, um, if they are used. From 2010 onwards, there were a huge investment in tablets, iPads, Apple, I think Apple lost Denmark. <laughs> 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 anyway, 
and uh, from 2005 onwards we have the, we have moved into the new wave of 3D printers, robots, and so on. I'm a little doubtful if that's a good idea, but okay. We, we are rich people in Denmark, so we can make money in that. So there's been this movement back and forth between technology investments and towards more didactic focus, and sometimes back again. And I think uh, Michael Fullan, who's an um, international well-known uh, reformist from uh, Canada, or anyway, he was part of the Ontario uh, reform movement, he has this point that there are wrong drivers and there are right drivers. And one of the wrongs are technology as a driver. But in Denmark, we have used technology as a driver a lot for a lot uh, of projects. And it hasn't, I think it has turned out that is right most of the time that it's the wrong focus to have. Of, of course, you need technology, but you also need to focus on that and professional development using IT. Um, and then there's been this movement toward promoting IT as a supporter of more progressive teaching and learning because there's this, and I guess you know, there's this uh, imagination that if you use technology, then you get more innovative progressive in your teaching, but that's not the case. The case is that if you want progressive, pro progressive teaching and learning, then you actually need to focus on that and use technology to, to support that. And luckily I will say that we have moved more, moved more towards that also in our administration and, and in the municipalities. So just shortly about tests and final exams, one of the things that I have uh, learned is very different from in the States. We have final exams that are both written and written composition, multiple choice and oral uh, um, examination. Um, we have a, a project work that is part of the final exam. Computers are allowed and even demanded now in some um, in some final exams, including access to the internet. So in, in the written composition um, assignment they the students are asked to use the internet to re to do research and answer the, the essay question. We also have a national computer-based adaptive test, uh, which is very much a problem in so many ways because it's testing the completely wrong things and it's so uh, uh, unprecise that it's uh, impossible to use the results. So but that's another discussion I just wanted to. So Denmark is in many ways in front. We have interactive whiteboards in all classes. We have, as I said, three students per computer and many schools have bring your own device policy. So there's compu enough computers. The teachers use computers a lot and they are actually pretty positive towards using computers as well. Um, even maybe sometimes, in my opinion, too positive towards it, but it's, I think it's good to build on positivity. <coughs> So, and 50% and, uh, of the teaching material used in 9th to, to 7th through 9th grade is digital nowadays. It's 24 in the middle uh, grades and 10% in the lower grades. Uh, which is not necessarily good, but as I'll show you later on, it, there seems to be some positive uh, development in, in the digital learning material. Uh, and it seems to uh, the ICILS is an the International Computer Information Literacy Study. Uh, I'm a national research uh, coordinator of that study, and the uh, Danish eighth grade students were among the best in, in that study, which was a, it was nice to know. But what's even more interesting is that, and this is a case in all countries, but also to a lot lot to high degree that that students all around the world and in Denmark do not have a critical awareness towards using uh, computers and using the internet and information, it was searching information and so on. And I think this is, thinking about the precedent in this country, is, it's a very, very important part of our um, goal in the next uh, years. So uh, we have had a lot of uh, what I would call innovative projects uh, set out to experiment with more innovative teaching and learning practices like Fab Lab at school. It was a project started actually down at Stanford. Uh, Pablo, Pablo Blickstein, I think. But uh, Denmark has been in this project for several years now. And the, the point is that the students uh, learn by, by creating stuff. So they um, get a design task, they 
um, investigate or inquire into the problems they could solve. They get ideas, create something to solve the, the problem, and they take them into use and reflect upon their uh, use and use all kind of 3D printers and, and also as well um, normal material stuff. Very interesting project uh, that meets a lot of challenges that we can learn a lot from, I think. We have a lot of municipalities having these uh, uh, entrepreneurship and, and innovate in, innova in innovation um, projects where students at all school in the municipality work on some kind of problem and meet in the end. So here's an example from Bailash, a small town in Jutland, um, where students work. And here's another from Kuru, a small, a small town in Zealand. Um, and this is what typically, it, they typically end with a meeting in some kind of a gymnasium some, somewhere in the municipality where the students present their work to someone from outside of school. Um, and as you can see here, they're taken seriously by the judges to be uh, adults somewhere from industry or something. I think very interesting projects with a lot of uh, opportunities. We also have a lot of focus on game-based learning, using Minecraft and uh, game-based uh, activities in school. Um, and um, then, as I promised, I'll tell you a little about the demonstration school projects, which were uh, five rather big projects where uh, researchers worked with schools to improve or to uh, promote more innovative teaching and learning in different ways. So this is three school development projects that I was uh, shared research director for. So we tried to integrate IT in the innovative school. We tried to focus on inclusion and differentiation. We tried to working with uh, teachers uh, professional development. Uh, the point was that we, instead of just working te technologically, we also worked with the school didactically uh, and organizationally. Because what we have found out in recent years was that um, maybe things can go well for a few days or a few weeks if we are working with teachers, but when we leave, everything turns back to normal. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to do was to try to intervene in three levels and try to understand all the modifications modificators um, that works into this uh, project that we take into school and then we would look at do they actually develop 21st century skills, do they have more innovative teaching and do the school culture develop in a more innovative direction, supporting more innovative school cultures. We did a lot of research both quantitative and qualitative um, and um, we found a lot of good news, which I'd like to share with you. So it, these project works in many ways. The teachers did actually go towards more innovative teaching, and, and it, it turned out that this way of working in pro professional development with all, over a longer period focused on actual uh, problem solving, <coughs> problem analyzing, uh, teaching material, and develop more um, innovative practices that made teachers more competent, which is good. So it works in many ways. The students did also develop more 21st century skills. But I think it's very important to say that this is not the whole picture. So Denmark is way ahead of many things in many ways. But if we look at the, the everyday practice, we'll see that in the teaching material, we did a study, uh, another study, me and some of my colleagues, we'll see that there's a lot of focus on spelling in the teaching materials and there's a lot of focus on literature analysis more than on interpretation or on um, communication analysis or uh, all the other important things that you should work on. And if you look at how teaching is, is performed, you'll see that there's a lot of repet repetitive work. So students are doing the same thing over and over, doing these uh, fill in the form blanks, uh, assignments. Uh, but you'll see that this um, so this shouldn't be <laughs> this should be seven, seven through nine and this should be so this is the end of the school year. So you'll see that there's, there's a shift towards the, the finals uh, years that the students get more and more um, what we call scaffolding practices. So they get more authentic problems and support for solving them. And what you will see is that there's a 
there's more of that using light digital material. You'll see there's more of uh, spelling using analog material. So this could be a sign that using digital uh, approaches actually is positive. So um, another thing I'll show you is um, that, yeah, this is from uh, um, observation studies we did. And as you will see, there's a lot of training tasks or repetitive uh, work and not so much on authentic tasks, especially in, in uh, math, you'll see it's training almost all the time, and no authentic tasks can be seen. So, so we, have this, um, we have this paradox that we have a lot of intentions, both from the administration and from research, but there's a, there's a traditional practice that's just continuing out there. And even in our demonstration school projects, projects we did see a lot of advanced uh, uh, pro progress, but, but it's not that the schools are completely different from before. So, so you could say that the lessons learned from these projects is that we, all, we still have rather traditional, not so progressive teaching, um, both material and practices. Uh, and as I said, technology is the wrong driver. We've seen that over and over again. Um, so what what we are working on is to to develop new projects uh, projects where teachers develop their didactical and their technolo technological competences at the same time. Um, so. As the last slide, I'll say that what we have learned is that we need uh, concurrency. We need to work both on technology infrastructure, but also on organization at schools. We need to work on the culture, understanding what it is teaching, how do students learn the best, how do we develop a culture of collaboration. We need to work on teachers' and students' competences, and we need to work on teaching material at the same time. And I think this is the lesson learned that we can give on to other countries, that it's not enough to focus on technology, which is what is often happening. So, thank you. Thank you.